Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our Friday meeting. Uh, thank you for attending just before Halloween. Uh, I'm Michael Troisi. Uh, I was going to go ahead and get started. So uh, if you have not already, we do have a sign-in form to have keep track of attendance for an active student member. Uh, what that means is basically you can vote in our elections if you do attend 50% of the meetings. That's just one of those SGA rules, and that's the only thing that prevents you from doing so. Um, you can always, the only thing you cannot do if you don't sign in is basically run for officer or elect an officer. Everything else in the club, you're free to do, and it's open for everyone. So this does not gatekeep you from any participation. And that's going to be open the entirety of this meeting. As always, we do have many ways you can keep in contact with us. Uh, one of them is our mailing list. Uh, we send out a newsletter every week detailing things that are happening this week, such as the workshops and the general body meeting topics. Um, we also have a shop this semester. We can buy things like masks that came in different colors recently, um, hoodies, uh, old ones, uh, t-shirts, all that fun stuff, you know, hoodie, uh, beanies, stuff like that, um, generic apparel. Um, our most popular platform is our Discord. That is where most of our members hang out and socialize and we post some other announcements there as well. Um, if you're not in there already, we encourage you to join that and just get to know some of us. And we do have a Twitter uh, where we do post announcements of general body meetings with some nice graphics that we're doing and just keep in touch with us on social media that way. So uh, today we will be going over announcements as always. Um, Jeffrey will be bringing us current events and then we'll, follow, we'll move into tool time with uh, Sarah who will be going over the Hashcat. And then we'll welcome our guest speaker, uh, Rory, with us to talk about the EFF and all about that. And then after that, uh, we'll go ahead and just go out with closing. So on to the announcements. Uh, as always, we do have operations meetings. Those run every Monday at 7.30 PM Eastern time. Um, it is going to be on Zoom. And we do share that link on our calendar, in our Discord, and on our web courses. And they're open to everyone. Uh, the content of those meetings is to plan the Friday meetings, such as this one, and upcoming workshops. Um, if you're interested in helping out with workshops and hosting them or giving ideas for them, you're welcome to join. Um, every Friday meeting thus far for this semester has fortunately been planned, so that's a little less work on us to do at this time. So some of the announcements today uh, will be Hack the Box CTF, a t-shirt and hoodie design competition. We announced it last week and it's still open. We'll just briefly recoup that uh, this week. Um, that's a typo. There is no budget amendment. Budget amendment. That's a tough word. I apologize. We won't be doing that today. So uh, CTFs this weekend, uh, starting term today and tomorrow. Um, here's a few ones on the side that um, you can check out if you want to do a CTF. I know today and tomorrow may be a difficult time with the holiday, but these are a few to keep in mind. Um, None of these are really main ones that we personally participate in, um, but the next one is, uh, and we'll get to that. So here's just a few inf information you can look up uh, after the meeting to participate. But the main one that we're going to focus on and advertise is the Hack the Box CTF. Um, that takes place uh, November 20th to the November 23rd. Uh, it's going to be a Jeopardy style CTF. And what that means is you are given a suite of categories and you choose uh, challenges to do in those categories. Some of them may be Pwn, some RE, some Crypto, some Forensics, and you can pick and choose things uh, in that field. Um, top teams who win this uh, will receive Hack the Box swag, um, some Parrot security um, merchandise, like stickers and stuff, and some digital OSINT credits if you place, I think, top five or top three. Um, but there's more information about that. If you are interested in participating or learning more about this, please contact Jeffrey or Sachin. Uh, they're both in the Discord server. Um, they are co-hosting the CTF for us. So if you're interested in doing that, please feel free to reach out to them. Uh, we did announce last uh, week, the slides haven't been updated yet. Um, we are doing a t-shirt and hoodie design competition. Um, you will be able to submit things up until Thursday, November 19th. Um, that's, right, that's the day before the meeting uh, of that time. Uh, we do have these templates provided. Um, to get those templates and the logos, please visit hackucf.org slash shirts. 
For any questions or for submissions for this competition, please do so by emailing shirts at hackycf.org. Um, there's some information about the technical requirements, but what we're looking for is someone to help design a t-shirt or hoodie for use this semester. Um, so something like that. The hoodies are going to be more of a thinner material. Well, we received positive feedback from them like a year or two ago when we made our first run. So we're doing that again. Um, and you are free to use our logo and come up with a design for either t-shirt or hoodie. You don't have to do both. I suppose you can do both, um, but it would be limited to one design per person um, for one design for the hoodie, one design for the t-shirt that is. And of course, uh, if you do make a design and submit it, you will be eligible for a prize if you are the winning design. Um, for t-shirts, you can, you are going to be winning a Raspberry Pi starter kit, a Raspberry Pi 4, four gigabyte starter kit. Um, and that's for the t-shirt competition. If you are designing and compete for the hoodie design competition and your design is chosen, um, you also get, you, you do get a Arduino starter kit. Um, that's good for hardware hacking and learning how um, certain electronics work. It comes with like buttons and LEDs and stuff like that. And of course, if you do win your design, you also do get a copy of that t-shirt and or hoodie for free. Um, and that's the uh, design competition for that. Um, of course, you can, for that, please email certs at hackycf.org. And for those templates and logos, visit hackycf.org slash certs. So this Saturday, that's tomorrow at noon, there will be a, a workshop on home labbing on a budget and a little home labbing concepts in general. That's going to be led by myself and Ryan, our VP, who I don't believe is here today. I think he's at work actually. So, but he will be there tomorrow with myself and lead that workshop. We're gonna talk about building a personal setup, home lab, how to get started on that, all stuff like that. It's a really useful tool to kind of um, do some projects on the side and get into the industry and have something on your resume. It's very useful. And if you're interested in that, uh, please come check it out tomorrow. And of course, we have our virtual cyber lab. That's a channel in the Discord where we socialize, hang out, we play games. Um, sometimes people, after the meeting, people like to hop in there and just stream a game or just socialize and hang out. But that is in the Discord to keep note of. Um, it's always open. Now we'll go ahead and bring it on to current events with Jeffrey. So take it away. Thank you. So um, next slide. So Flash, as we all know, is going to be dead by the end of this year. So um, Adobe has been working with um, several manufacturers, including Windows, to um, pretty much prepare. And one of these pre preparation updates is Windows 10 update KB4577586, which will remove and block Flash Player from being installed on Windows 10. Except it didn't work. Um, when it officially comes out through Windows Update in early 2021, it will, um, or it's supposed to remove Flash automatically, but as of right now, it doesn't seem to be doing much of anything. So um, this will, um, as I said, hopefully be pushed out functionally um, at the end of the, um, at the um, end of the year, early 2021, when Flash is indeed officially dead. Next slide. Speaking of things that are gone, the YouTube DL is too. Um, they received a DMCA takedown from RIAA from the music industry last Friday for DRM circumvention. It, in their takedown, they cited test code on Vigo music videos as justification that the tool is designed for piracy. And of course the internet had a field day with this. There were tons of forks of YouTube DL that came out, including some actually on the GitHub DMCA repo, which is a bad idea. Do not edit the DMCA repo on GitHub. Um, and there's some more benevolent forks that remove the offending example code to quote unquote reapprove YouTube DL. As of today, the repo is not reinstated. Next slide. So, other things are gone. Some Amazon employees got fired um, for sharing customer data with an unauthorized third party. The affected customers were directly emailed and according to Amazon, the employees were fired and reported to authorities. It's unknown how many customers were affected by this because Amazon refuses to comment, but this shows an interesting um, and increasing trend of 
insiders in a company going rogue um, for their own interest. Just last month, Shopify had a breach of about 200 merchants originating from a similar inside attack. And next slide, finally, um, on the topic of emails, as election day approaches, the FBI released um, some advisories on voter intimidation emails from state actors. One notable example is the um, Proud Boys spoofed email, um, which originates from an Iranian APT, which uses IP addresses from NordVPN and other VPN providers. Some of these emails um, have attached a video of them hacking the voting systems, but um, it's very likely that these videos might be faked, um, which these videos show like tools like SQL map in action, but they believe that the um, people in question are very potentially able to perform basic hacks. Remember, um, in the state of Florida, um, voter information is public. So if you get a similar voter intimidation email, it's entirely possible that they just had um, went to one of those websites that have voter registration public and use that. Don't fall for voter intimidation. Don't forget to vote. And that's it for um, current events. I'll hand it over for Sarah for some hash cat pool time. Hey guys, can you hear me? Awesome. Um, so this week we will be doing a crash course on Hashcat. What do you need to know to crack those hashes? Um, next slide. Well, we will be cracking all the hashes. Um, next slide. So what is Hashcat? Hashcat by Wikipedia is called a password recovery tool, but it really is so much more than that. If you have a hash of a password, you can run it through Hashcat and it can return the password. Um, depending on the type of hash you have, it won't always return the password, but you have a good chance of finding it from a hash. Um, Hashcat is maintained by Team Hashcat and is currently open source. It was open sourced in 2015. Um, next slide. Um, passwords are securely stored as hashes, a one-way function that perverts plain text passwords into a random string. And there are different ways of encoding these strings, and Hashcat can take the type of hash it is as a, um, a flag kind of in the command. Um, hashes cannot be directly reversed. So Hashcat rapidly calculates the hash of many passwords. When the calculated hash matches the hash being checked against, we can conclude that the password we just ran through the hash function must be the password that was initially used to generate the hash. Next slide. So how do I get Hashcat and where can I use it? Well, Hashcat you can use on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. I haven't tried it on um, WSL, but you could probably do that too. And it can be downloaded from Hashcat's website, although I think app, get, app install Hashcat does work as well. Um, and it, takes, it can take advantage of CP, GPUs to accelerate the process. Um, it does make it faster, but you can force it through your CPU. Um, when I did my big hash cracking, I was using a big GPU farm and that did make it go faster. If you don't have a GPU, I recommend doing something like John, which is probably faster than Hashcat. Next slide. So Hashcat uses. Hashcat options, and then you can put the file that contains your hashes. So you would just take a text file with nano or vim or whatever text editor you're using and just put the hashes and then give the file to Hashcat and then the dictionary that you're using. And I believe Hashcat's website has examples of the dictionaries that you can use and you can even like make your own dictionaries to use with Hashcat. You can also run a benchmark to estimate the cracking speed, which you can do with TAC B, which is like how good is it going to how long is it going to take if you want to decide whether or not you want to go to some other hash cracking tool because Hashcat's going to take too long. And Hashcat will by default use your GPUs to calculate hashes, but with TAC TAC force, you can make it use your CPU, which I don't necessarily recommend, but you know, if you have to use Hashcat, then you can use TAC TAC force. Hashcat supports many different hash types specified with M. Some of the supported values are MD5, SHA-182, NTLM, 7-zip, LastPass, 1-password, and there's a bunch of other ones, Office documents. So if you're on that hack the box and you see a really weird hash, 
Just our Hashcat can take it and crack it for you. You can even write your own rules with Hashcat, but this can be fairly complex and not within the scope of this presentation as this is just a crash course. But you can find more of that at the link that I put there if you're interested in how to do that. Um, next slide. Oh, that's it. That was my crash course, guys. So hopefully you know how to take a file and how to crack it. Um, thanks. There for the uh, Hashcat uh, crash course. So uh, we'll go ahead and move on to our main talk. That's going to be the EFF uh, brought to us by Rory. So I'll just go ahead and uh, give it to you. There we go. Okay. Yeah, the uh, presentation mode always throws me, but um, hey, Hack UCF, um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak with you all today, and I'm excited to go over um, kind of who the EFF is, what the EFA is. Um, spoiler alert, you're already a part of it, so you'll get to learn more about um, the kind of benefits that come with membership there. Um, just to confirm, um, we'll be, I have until um, 45 minutes from now, is that right? Um, you do have like at the latest until seven, so you've got plenty of time. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, yeah, and another just quick order of business, please feel free to interrupt me with questions. Um, I have a lot to say. I'm very talkative, um, but you know, my voice needs a rest sometime. So um, you can, under participants, raise your hand or click yes, or really any symbol I'm going to call on you if you press it. So um, go ahead and use that for questions. Um, and then if I ask any yes or no type questions, feel free to just throw them in the chat and uh, I'll get a sense of where you're all at. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to just go over really quickly who I am, why I'm talking uh, today, uh, who's the EFF, kind of what's our history, our values, and the kind of activism we're a part of. Um, what is the Electronic Frontier Alliance? Um, and then I'm going to go over some student issues because I think student groups like your uh, yourselves are really important for the work we do. Um, and then some time for Q&A um, if you have any questions about either the EFF or the EFA or really anything I talk about. Um, so who am I? Um, so I'm the grassroots advocacy organizer at the EFF and I'll get a little more into what that means when I'm talking about the Electronic Frontier Alliance, which is uh, the group I help maintain. Uh, but the really short version is that I'm looking for local activists and groups uh, to find ways to support them and connect them with each other uh, to make sure that our issues are being advocated for on every corner of the country, um, you know, no city too small. Um, I'm also a graduate student from the City University of New York uh, in developmental psychology, uh, which seems pretty unrelated, but um, it actually, um, through my experience as an instructor in psychology, um, I co-founded a Electronic Frontier Alliance group called Cypher Collective, uh, which um, did small like hacking tutorials, but also uh, for more general audience, um, sort of how-tos of basic security, uh, um, you know, so the lay user knows how to protect themselves online. Um, some specific issues I work on at the EFF, and again, we'll get a little more into this, um, is copyright and patents which is less fun as to talk about than security and privacy, but is incredibly important. You mentioned the YouTube DL uh, DMCA takedown, the Digital Mo uh, Millennium Copyright Act, uh, which enabled uh, the RIAA to take down this code for having an example code that allegedly um, infringed on copyright, but RIAA, uh, it's problematic for reasons I won't get too deep into, um, but they don't really have the copyright ownership over that. So um, yeah, the internet is held together with uh, weird and confusing and often bad copyright and patent law that we're hoping to set right and make more equitable. Um, and going right into that DRMs um, and free software, uh, big advocates for free software, and the kind of simple notion that uh, if you buy a device or you own it software, you should, pro you should be able to use it however you like, because at that point, it's yours. And that includes right to repair uh, for when a new Windows update ruins everything. Um, 
I'm also, since I have a background as an academic, really big on open science and open education. And this gets, again, continuation of our copyright system that information should be available to all. Um, and with open education, not only should educational materials be available, uh, they should be free and students shouldn't pay for textbooks anymore. That's my position, um, which hopefully all are sympathetic to. Um, and then of course, student privacy, which um, I'll talk a lot more about later. Uh, and the last thing I'm working on is uh, video games and virtual reality. Um, I think both of these are a little neglected in the digital rights space, uh, maybe just not being seen as uh, the same as traditional media. I think it's important to kind of keep in mind that these are forms of expression and they are even more importantly mediums for our connections with one another. Uh, so a really bad lockdown VR headset might only affect a few people today, but if that technology is successful and becomes more prominent, we'll be stuck uh, with a lockdown and bad system. Uh, Jeffrey knows what I'm talking about. Um, so that's all well and good. Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF, what is this F organization? Um, so EFF was founded um, in 1990. So we just had our 30 year anniversary as a nonprofit. Um, and the story behind its founding is actually pretty interesting. Um, essentially the secret service was going after a hacker who had found, um, who had accessed uh, files that revealed information about the 911 emergency phone system. Um, and they were worried about potentials for that to be abused um, and yeah, ultimately clog up the uh, line for 911 emergencies. Um, and so they were looking for anyone that this hacker may have sent files to. And they had evidence that they tried to send it to Steve Jackson Games, a little game maker. Um, and in the process of investigating uh, Steve Jackson, uh, they were able to access his email server and without permission access, delete, change information on that uh, server. And between that and all the disruption where he had to close down his business for quite a while, um, he, he was ticked off basically. He was ready to take it to court. Uh, his rights he knew had been violated uh, and there were no protections. But the thing is, because it was computers, there was a lot of hand waving of those terms and a lot of civil rights groups didn't feel um, adequate for addressing the, that sort of civil rights infringement. Um, so that's when um, these three folks here, um, Mitch Kapoor, um, John Barry Barlow, Barlow at the bottom, and then John Gilmore, um, they were in this online community known as Whole Earth Electronic Link or Well. Um, they heard about this story and decided, you know, this is such an important case. It's setting this horrible precedent that emails have no protection whatsoever, uh, that they formed the EFF and uh, took on the case. Um, and fortunately, uh, it went well. And they were able to establish in court that emails should get at least as much protection as phone calls, uh, meaning there should be a warrant and probable cause and et cetera to access emails. You can't just on a suspicion, access someone's email server um, and start deleting things. Um, so that's the past. Um, and it was founded with this mission statement. Uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has been established to civilize the electronic frontier uh, to make it useful and beneficial, not just to the technical elite, but to everyone. And to do this in keeping with our society's highest traditions of free and open flow of information and communication. Um, so. You know, I personally like the frontier terminology. It, it kind of invokes the Old West. One of the founders, John Perry Barlow, was actually a cattle rancher. Um, and it is kind of this untamed territory where people think current laws don't apply or they force them to apply in ways that don't make sense. Um, so we, our mission is to take on that frontier and help make sure that just because there are new terms and new technologies that our basic civil rights are not violated. Um, so some more specific issues that the EFF takes on, privacy is the big one, um, from Edward Snowden re revelations to face recognition being prominent, uh, we're really concerned about making sure that you're able to live a private life, um, should you choose. 
I mean, get to have a reasonable expectation of privacy security. Uh, there's, we'll talk about a little bit more, there's constant threats of ending encryption and um, all these things that have this privacy component, but also have a very real security component to them as well. Um, that your information in the wrong hands equates into a threat to yourself. Um, and also, yeah, so that the black hat hacker, hackers can't um, take advantage of you. Uh, free expression, uh, we think that um, online, the internet is a really great opportunity for folks to come together and for voices that are often marginalized to be heard. And a, an important part of that is ensuring that no one entity can bottleneck and censor speech online. Um, transparency, um, again, this goes with open source and um, kind of those other values that when these technologies are implemented, especially by the state, it should be done so in a way that everyone kind of knows what's going on. They can kind of consent to what's happening or at least um, mitigate um, the threats to them. And then of course, creativity and innovation. And that's where things like video games come in where uh, folks should be able to use culture and participate in culture by remixing it, redistributing it, um, and all these things that get derided as just piracy. But um, you know, if you can read and remix a book with no cost to a publisher, uh, it makes sense that you should be allowed to do so. Um, yeah, and the way we advocate for these principles are um, in three ways. Uh, one is impact litigation and policy analysis. That's what our legal team works on. Um, activism, that's the team I'm a part of, and then technology development. Um, and fortunately, we have over three, uh, 30,000 uh, active donors. We'd be in maybe some trouble if we only had 3,000 um, in over in 90 countries. Um, and because we are so overwhelmingly funded by these individual donors, uh, we have a lot of leeway um, that you know, we don't have to work, walk on eggshells when doing any advocacy because we're not beholden to any one grant or any one big entity for our funding. Um, so again, our kind of three pillars of the EFF. Uh, the first one, the legal side. Um, if you or someone you know has a legal trouble, uh, don't talk to me, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but feel free to email info at EFF.org. Um, our legal team, um, is always interested to hear your case. Um, it could be something as simple as you found a vulnerability in um, a piece of software and you wanna be sure you can report it in a safe way. Um, but all the way to if you're being sued and you think the EFF might take on your case, uh, please just email info <clears throat> at EFF.org. Um, and at the very least, the legal team uh, will refer you to someone who can help if they can't themselves. <clears throat> We also focus a lot on impact litigation. So impact litigation, a quick civics review. Um, the legislative branch um, will pass the laws and then it's up to the courts to kind of refine what the law actually means and if it is constitutional and how it will be applied. Um, so impact litigation are cases where we're worried about if a bad decision comes, uh, be it on the Supreme Court level or lower levels, uh, it'll have a bigger impact on digital freedoms in the future. So we take on cases that we think uh, will kind of promote more freedom in the digital space. Uh, one such example is um, currently ongoing, so I'm not gonna say too much about it, um, but EFF versus San Francisco, um, basically we had advocated and got passed um, an ordinance in San Francisco that basically required law enforcement to um, report to a board of directors when uh, they wanted to access surveillance technology, such as cameras. Um, and then earlier this year during the Black Lives Matter protests, uh, through a FOIA request, we found uh, evidence that they were accessing these cameras without that permission. Uh, so we're taking on that case um, to uphold the policy that we had already advocated for. Um, <clears throat> Similarly, uh, folks might have heard of FOSTA. Um, in the participant, how many folks have heard of SESTA FOSTA are vaguely familiar with it in the chat? Or? No. Yeah, so real quick summary. Um, it was a federal level uh, law that passed a few years ago now um, 
that basically it was called the Fight um, Online Sex Trafficking Act, uh, which was a little bit of a misnomer. Um, it certainly a lot of senators voted for it, thinking that that's what it was doing. Uh, but in actuality, um, it created incentive for online platforms to censor uh, speech um, having to do with sexuality. Um, so a big example is Tumblr after this act um, suddenly had a purge of content uh, because they were so worried about being sued. Like if someone posts nudity on their website, uh, they were worried about being sued under this act. Um, so they kind of set up a machine learning model to just scan and get rid of all uh, sexual content on the platform. And what that ultimately did was deleted a lot of art and it deleted a lot of very innocuous information. Uh, for example, sand dunes, um, pictures of sand dunes in the desert uh, were removed automatically because uh, they were a little too suggestive. Um, and ultimately that sort of law incentivize a more restrictions on free speech uh, under the guise of, in this case, uh, fighting online trafficking. Uh, but it, oftentimes it's under the guise of copyright infringement, which is why uh, that YouTube DL story is so important. Um, <clears throat> our legal team also helps inform policy. So we'll often uh, write up amicus briefs uh, to suggest um, how court cases should go, write model legislation um, for how a city or state uh, should implement better privacy procedures. Um, and yeah, so that's the legal team. Um, we also have our tech team, um, which I'm hoping y'all heard of these things. Um, I'll, I'll pause real quick. I think I see Alex uh, Vazzi has a question. Nope. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. So technology team, hopefully you um, had, uh, you've heard of a few of these tools. Um, one is Privacy Badger. How many of y'all have heard of Privacy Badger? A Y or N in the chat. Yeah. Um, so at least one. Um, so I hope y'all uh, use it. It's um, basically a simple web extension uh, that stops third party trackers from secretly recording what pages uh, you visit on the web. Um, for a long time, it had um, a machine learning component that it would learn uh, based on your browsing behavior, um, what trackers to block and unblock. Um, unfortunately, uh, we found vulnerabilities where, or not vulnerability, but we found that that made your fingerprint or your browser more unique online. So we moved away from that, but are working on um, more community-based machine learning and finding ways to privately uh, uh, unlock that same learning potential, but in a way that preserves anonymity. Um, there's also HTTPS everywhere. Um, so secure HTTP um, is um, <clears throat> implemented in a lot of websites, but it's not defaulted to in a lot of websites. Uh, so we made this tool, this extension, that makes sure you request from every website uh, for the secure connection. Uh, CertBot, if you're on the more uh, administrative side of things, um, you know this is something I've set up a lot with using Raspberry Pi. Um, it's a way to give your projects a quick and easy and free SSL certificate with Let's Encrypt. Um, and this is really great because I don't know if y'all were working on this uh, back when SSL costs money to get, that you had to pay your web host for it. Um, but the um, bringing about Let's Encrypt and CertBot has um, drastically increased the amount of um, encrypted traffic online um, that otherwise was really stuck because no one wanted to pay money for security. Why would you want security? Um, and then finally, uh, Panopticlick, um, which <clears throat> is a research tool uh, that if you go to it, uh, panacticlip.eff.org, uh, you can see how unique your browser fingerprint is. Um, and similar with the Privacy Badger, um, the more unique it is, the more people can track you and your behavior online. Uh, and it offers some advice for how to make it a little less unique. Finally, activism. Um, so <clears throat> this is where, uh, this is the team I'm a part of. Uh, one of our big things is our Deep Links blog. Um, hope you consider following eff.org slash deep links, uh, where we are kind of leading, trying to lead the discussion around digital rights um, on 
issues as they emerge uh, without having to go through all the hoops of uh, writing the policy and um, taking on court cases, we can kind of more directly say, this is the right or wrong way to do something. Um, so Oculus came up before. I, for example, wrote a post on the blog <clears throat> about Oculus and the Facebook sign-in um, called If Privacy Dies in VR, It Dies in Real Life. Um, and that was very much our kind of planting a flag in the ground of like, hey, we're going to take on this issue if Facebook uh, continues um, to undermine user privacy and other VR companies as well. Um, we also take on training. So if you need um, a training from our experts, either legal, um, technical, or just kind of more organizing trainings, uh, you can email trainers at EFF.org and we can set up talks like this one, but a little more focus on a particular um, topic. And then the big one, of course, is campaigns. Uh, so this is the EFF Action Center. And we have, uh, these are some of our current campaigns going on. Uh, our most popular of which is the Stop Earn It Bill, uh, which really blew up this weekend. Um, I mean, that weekend, this summer. Um, I'm not sure what time is anymore in quarantine. Um, but yeah, so the Earn It Act, uh, for folks who aren't familiar, um, is a <clears throat> bill that moves to change uh, the Copyright Decency Act, uh, Communications Decency Act, rather, um, particularly Section 230. And this is especially appropriate now, because I think y'all may have heard of Section 230 coming up a lot recently. I know President Trump has called for abolishing Section 230, um, but also Democrats are upset with Section 230. Um, and there's a lot of talk. The TLDR is Section 230 is the guarantee that if you host a website and someone posts something to your website that is illegal, you don't get in trouble for it. Um, and it's really fundamental to the internet as we know it. Um, if you imagine every, essentially it would disincentivize any user uploaded or any contribution from users to websites because it poses such a huge legal risk of if they accept text, you can just post code that is copyrighted um, and then <clears throat> you could be, the website owner could be sued. Um, basically any data that can be uploaded um, would pose legal risk. So we like Section 230. Um, it promotes a free and open internet. Um, and the issue is with Earn It, uh, they tried to implement kind of a standards that you, that this protection is only conditional uh, based on um, your use of it. Um, <clears throat> real quick for Andrew, the arguments for removing it is, yeah, there's a few of them. Um, so for example, I said Trump was against it and that argument tends to be um, big media companies like Facebook or Twitter, uh, they claim have a anti-conservative bias um, and that section 230 is somehow enabling them to do that, uh, that instead uh, they should be more regulated to not have bias on their platform, uh, which essentially means they want to suppress um, they want to make sure there's equal amounts um, and artificially change that. Um, as other arguments that are more common on the democratic side um, are companies like Google, for example, gets away with making money off of YouTube, even when someone submits copyrighted content. Um, and, you know, the worry is, well, Google, we should be able to sue Google for that when someone else posts copyrighted content on their website. Um, and I'm, there are some folks that are arguing it in good faith. I think a lot of folks just want to sue people who have more money, um, but that's my personal take. Um, ultimately, these changes to Section 230 um, are not the way to go. We'd love to see more um, accountability and transparency from these media companies, uh, but attacking 230 is fundamentally breaking the internet as we know it. Um, and one such issue is with the Earn It Act uh, to make this Section 230 protection conditional. Um, if you meet certain standards, you're allowed to have that protection. Um, and the long and short of it is um, essentially you have to provide a backdoor to your encryption <laughs> um, is one such standard that they would want to include in that. Um, essentially, 
a roundabout way to ban encryption on websites because, you know, if you're Google and you have the choice between being sued every time someone re-uploads a YouTube video or just get rid of encryption and let the government in, uh, you're probably going to choose the one that doesn't involve a total tsunami of, cop of copyright lawsuits. Um, so it creates this huge incentive to dismantle encryption online. Um, but yeah, so that's a really big one. Um, definitely stop by the Action Center, act.eff.org, uh, if you want to sign that petition. Uh, we have the San Francisco one that I mentioned and a few others on there. Um, um, but yeah, in addition to all that stuff, um, the thing I really like about the activism team is we get to do a lot of fun things. Um, a few years ago, we were able to borrow a blimp from Greenpeace, um, which and flew it over a data center in Utah, uh, saying NSA illegal spying below. Um, and then more recently had a challenge to Shaq to um, end his endorsement of ring devices um, and acknowledge the security and um, problematic ties they have with law enforcement. Um, and then more quarantine speed, we had a series of um, live events on Twitch, uh, including a EFF Q&A in Animal Crossing, which I was a part of. And um, yeah, I was really impressed with my colleagues' ability to make beautiful things in Animal Crossing. Um, so I want to be mindful of time, so I'm going to go a little bit faster. Uh, these are just a few things that uh, these three teams have been able to put together. Um, one is a surveillance self-defense guide, um, which is a guide of basic security tips, um, kind of how to use tools, explainers for concepts in cybersecurity, um, and tailored scenarios that maybe you don't know what you don't know or what you need. Uh, you can find a scenario that kind of gives you some first steps. And the importance of this is it's something we've really committed to in the long haul. A lot of these guides kind of go up in a blog and then five years later are totally inaccurate and not useful anymore. Uh, we regularly update we make sure that they get legal and tech reviews regularly um, and then maintain several translations of these resources as well um, so that it's here now and it's here as long as the EFF is around. Um, <clears throat> the other big project is uh, street level surveillance. Again, our three teams come together uh, to the tech team analyzes different surveillance tools. Uh, the lawyers come together on policy that can help uh, rein in these surveillance tools and the activists kind of put together guides for how to um, handle your privacy, but also how to advocate for these changes. Um, so I'll skip that for now. Another big tool I want to make sure I show you all is uh, Atlas of Surveillance, uh, which you can check out at atlassurveillance.org, uh, which uh, we just recently launched a few months ago. Um, and it's a database for the United States showing uh, public use of surveillance technology. So it's part of the SLS team. Um, so some of the technologies that we keep track of are on the right side, uh, body-worn cameras, drones, face recognition, et cetera. And it's an interactive map that you can actually pull up uh, your state and see, okay, there's 800 and about 50 uses of surveillance technology in Florida. Um, and then you can zoom in and see exactly which um, precincts and which um, enforcement offices are actually using this technology. Um, so it's a little hard to convey on this, but if you check out the website, you can see Orlando, for example, um, has 17, or the county and Orlando, the city, uh, together have about 17 agreements for this technology on record. Um, so it's a really great way to see what surveillance is actually out there um, and yeah, what to actually be worried about. All right, so that's all EFF. I'm gonna go really quick about EFA, which Congratulations, you're already a member of. Um, so EFA started in about 2015, and it's really a goal that EFF takes on federal issues very often, tries to take on a lot of international and state issues, uh, but sometimes it falls through the crack, really local issues. Um, it's hard for us to invest in each city or each um, state even, uh, <clears throat> our advocacy work into it. So part of the goal of the EFA is to come together with other like-minded organizations um, in the country and find ways to build mutual support and um, sort of a decentralized network of advocates and educators. Um, so 
the barrier to entry is pretty low. You just have to be a group that participates in local um, or things regularly um, and open to the public and endorse our five principles of free expression, um, security, privacy, creativity, and access to knowledge. Uh, Joe sounds pretty familiar. Um, <clears throat> so how it works for the groups such as yourselves, um, you have access to our platform and promotion. We, if you have an event coming up um, and you want it promoted in Florida or even just in the Orlando region, uh, we have a mailing list that we can really do some targeting promotion for on your behalf. Uh, and I, I didn't check how many folks are in the Orlando area, but often this is at least a few thousand recipients on our mailing list uh, that will get an alert about your work. Um, and then of course on social media, we do our best to promote uh, what you have online and we'll post to our Twitter and Facebook and all our uh, 500,000 followers on there. Um, and of course, it's we only do this when you ask in particular because we want to be mindful that sometimes groups don't want to be overwhelmed with a bunch of strangers from the internet. Um, so it's really if you want to have a public event with a bigger turnout, we'll do everything we can to help promote it on our platform. Um, pending capacity, we uh, try to offer assistance from our legal and tech teams. If y'all are curious about how a piece of surveillance technology works, for example, uh, and you reach out to us, we can try to connect you to one of the experts that we have in-house that are actually analyzing that and they can maybe come do a quick talk about how that's used. And similarly with legal, if there's a bad city policy coming through, uh, we can send it to our legal experts and if they have time, they can go through it and give advice about the language. Um, and then really connecting to similar groups such as yourselves. Um, so in particular, I'm trying to organize more student groups and make sure that student groups are able to um, share their experiences. Um, and I'm, a fortunate thing about student groups, super motivated, super creative, like bleeding edge on everything. I love student groups. Um, the unfortunate thing is they do graduate and become not students at some point. Um, and that often all those lessons and all those things that came out of those groups kind of dissipate. So we want to make sure that student groups are connected with each other to learn from each other, but also kind of create kind of a more long-term uh, knowledge building along the student, uh, <clears throat> among the student groups. Um, yeah, and then more generally supporting your work in any way we can and give advice in organizing. Uh, for us, um, the really big thing we get is more awareness from local issues. If there's anything happening on your campus or in your city, uh, let us know and we will look into ways that we can support and take on these issues potentially because it's really important. These precedents get started on the local level and we want to be aware of them as they come up. Um, and then, yeah, the other great thing is we create a lot of materials that um, we want to have out there to help groups like yourselves and being able to get some direct feedback and customize those materials for you, um, make those materials stronger for us. Um, talking about my group, um, or my position rather, um, I'll go super quick. Uh, basically, I want to find these groups and bring them into the EFA so that um, we have more groups that are aligned and able to support each other. Um, and then I want to, with the groups that we currently have, do everything I can to make y'all more successful. Um, that means better promotion, um, helping with organizing, um, you know, if you need any advice in terms of um, more structural things, um, I'm definitely here for y'all to support. Um, those are kind of the two big things I work on. Um, yeah, and then identifying where different EFA groups can come together on shared issues. Um, I'm gonna actually, yeah, I'm gonna skip a few slides because I wanna be mindful of y'all's time. Um, but generally speaking, uh, we have three categories of EFA groups and this is super loose. There are plenty of groups that are in multiple or all of the categories, uh, but one is advocacy groups, um, which work on, um, again, more of the policy side of things. Um, one such group is um, the Students Against Data abuse, abuse in 
uh, University of North Carolina, Charlotte, um, a student group that has been advocating not only for policy changes on campus, but have been really active in Charlotte and um, have actually been able to connect to a lot of the representatives and um, have been pushing on a face recognition ban in the city. Um, <clears throat> oh, and they also, I almost forgot, they held our first uh, VR EFA event, which was a really great experience and I think a good example of why um, we want such a diverse group of members in the EFA uh, that, you know, all these kind of new approaches and new ways of doing things, we all learned from helping them organize with that um, was a really great experience. They didn't necessarily feel like they knew how to um, orchestrate that. And I frankly didn't either, uh, but being able to work on that, it's now something that we're maybe not quite ready to do regularly uh, because there were plenty of hiccups, uh, but it's something that is now on the radar and um, something we can, all EFA groups and the EFF can now benefit from. Um, so one campaign um, that's been big for the advocacy groups is our About Face campaign, uh, the call for the end of the public use of face recognition um, in surveillance. Uh, so, and more broadly, uh, police oversight and surveillance technology. Uh, but this has been one that many of our advocacy groups in Portland, in Boston, in San Francisco, and um, other cities where these bans are actually getting passed, have participated in um, that advocacy. Um, so definitely check out that one if you want to address face recognition in Orlando. Um, and then the other kind of bucket is educational groups. Um, I'll just comment on my former group, Cypher Collective. Um, so before coming to the EFF, I co-founded uh, Cypher, which was a combination of general um, security tips for the public, and we held those regular workshops at a uh, public library. Um, but we also had more focused and more intensive courses for um, activists and journalists that wanted to take extra precautions in protecting their data. Um, and yeah, doing that work and being approached by EFA, um, yeah, we were one of the early EFA joiners as well. Um, and yeah, it helped us the combination of our relationship with our library and the EFA really helped us hold that space regularly. And I'm glad to say that the Cypher Collective is still going on, even though I have left them earlier this year um, to come to the EFF for clarification. Um, and then Future Ada, another great educational group focused on underrepresented genders in tech. Um, and for <clears throat> our educators, we have the Security Education Companion, which is part of our um, SSD that I mentioned earlier, Security Self-Defense or Surveillance Self-Defense. Um, and these are pre-made lesson plans uh, that are organized in a way that ideally you could quickly put together a lesson plan based on how much time you have for a training. Uh, so for example, you could go over basics of encryption, about 30 minutes, and then maybe do how to install signal, 30 minutes, et cetera. <clears throat> Print all these out or just have them on your laptop and you're ready to go with a pre-made lesson plan that's been uh, put together by the EFA groups and the EFF and is similar to the SSD verified to be accurate and legally approved. Um, and then our maker and hacker spaces. Um, I wanted to shout out a bunch of them because I am a big fan of our um, hacker spaces. Um, and it sounds like you all do a lot of events that are aligned with these hacker spaces. Um, Baby Castles in New York uh, puts together indie video games and um, hacks together old consoles. Um, Crash Space in LA, um, as long as gray area, a little more artistic maker spaces um, that do really cool projects. And then we have plenty of DEF CON groups. I'm going to point out DEF CON 201 in New Jersey uh, that uh, put together regular um, hacking events, um, also participating in things like Hack the Box. Um, and have really excelled in doing these kind of bringing hacker spaces online. Uh, so these are groups that we try to foster more connections between them, especially now that, you know, we're all online anyway. So hopefully um, can share the creativity and innovation. Um, all right, so I'm gonna give myself a quick break in speaking and ask you all, um, what are some digital rights issues that you're worried about, especially ones that are maybe relevant to campus um, 
that yeah, you've noticed or are worried about coming about? Um, Oh, yeah, go ahead, Andrew. You can unmute and ask about right to repair. OK, I'll, I'll read out loud. Um, oh, sorry for the lack of unmute. Um, so for Andrew, um, question, you mentioned right to repair. Uh, did you have any quick thoughts on how companies like Apple and Samsung, especially in the mobile area, trying to stifle right to repair by using serialized components in their devices that do not allow them to be replaced um, even with OEM components. Um, for sure. Yeah, that's, um, it's a good example of um, ways that, so unfortunately, Apple oftentimes is good on things like privacy, uh, relatively, um, but then are just really um, restrictive on your ability to buy this almost thousand dollar device and actually um, not even mod it for unintended purposes, but even doing things like replacing the screen yourself is restricted. And then um, parts are artificially made to be um, not able to replace um, because of these proprietary um, components that are used. Um, I think another really famous example is with John Deere tractors where um, when you think of tractors, you don't necessarily think of like super technical uh, things um, or machinery, uh, but they essentially added to a lot of their components microchips that have this DRM code on it that says, hey, an essential computer that says, hey, if these codes on these uh, components don't have the correct code, uh, then don't run and don't approve of these tools. Um, so these sort of artificial restrictions, you know, they have clear benefits to the companies because they can charge much higher prices for things like repair and repair parts. Uh, but it ultimately restricts our ability to actually take care of ourselves. And then there's the issue of when these companies or if these companies go out of business, we're stuck with these lemons that we can't fix uh, artificially. Um, I definitely recommend one um, activist at the EFF, Cory Doctorow, is also an accomplished sci-fi writer. Um, his book of short stories, Radicalize, uh, the first one, Unauthorized Bread, uh, gets into that in a way that I think is really um, illustrative. Um, and then Daniel says, uh, mandatory use of UCF app for contact tracing. I'm going to put a pin on that because I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Um, and then Jeffrey. Um, Oh, the same thing for the self-checker. Got it. So in that case, I'll just get to what I had here. Um, some examples of um, <clears throat> campus issues that have come up. Um, one is privacy. Uh, campus surveillance itself. Um, I know uh, University of Miami came in the news recently uh, for using face recognition on campus. Um, and while we don't ban uh, the use of face recognition by uh, private entities like the University of Miami, uh, we do oppose uh, law enforcement or um, law enforcement to have access to that technology. Um, monitoring social media. Uh, this is something that a lot of students don't even know that their schools are doing. Uh, there are tools like Social Sentinel, which are basically ways to mass surveil the students on Facebook and Twitter and uh, Twitch and kind of have a way to automate that surveillance that you feed it basically uh, your students' emails and names, and it connects it to all the social medias uh, that they can find registered to that student and monitor it for um, issues, which, of course, is going to chill people's uh, free speech when online um, and sets up this hostile relationship with students. Um, and then the big one is ed tech, and not just the big names um, that we're always worried about, but increasingly with the move to remote learning. Uh, there are uh, concerns about Zoom and proctoring software apps where um, they take control, um, root control of your device and control your webcam. And, you know, your instructor is able to record you and all these really creepy things that invade your privacy uh, unduly. 
um, in a way that it wouldn't be if you were, you know, in person and not learning remotely. Um, <clears throat> there's also equity issues. Uh, so big one is digital divide. Um, oftentimes universities will assume everyone has an up-to-date laptop and a smartphone and their own internet, high-speed internet access. Uh, but oftentimes, um, in fact, usually that's not the case for students um, where they maybe only have a smartphone or they have to share a laptop or they just have an awful internet connection and it's much more difficult for them to use these tools offered by uh, the campus. Um, and then issues of open access, like I was saying before uh, with textbooks, um, you know, digital technology gives us the ability to replicate books um, for virtually no cost. Um, and there are plenty of people willing to write high quality textbooks for free, um, as evident by things like Wikipedia. Um, so OER, I think is one thing I really wanna drive the message across is schools that adopt these open education books, textbooks and such, uh, wind up saving their students millions of dollars uh, because you don't have to spend, you know, $100 on a used textbook for, you know, some previous, um, previously relevant um, author. So that's one big thing. And the other big thing is open access, uh, that the work of researchers um, that is publicly funded should be available to all. Similarly with patents, um, and that's something that sometimes students will participate in labs um, at their university or participate in projects. And ultimately this work that is publicly funded often winds up in the hands of what we call patent trolls, where they basically pay a one-time upfront cost to, for that patent from the university and then have no intention to do anything with it. Uh, they just litigate and sue everyone who has anything remotely similar, uh, suing them for millions and millions of dollars. But good news, you can also just pay us off for a few thousand dollars and make this problem go away. So uh, patent trolls are everywhere. And a big thing is campuses should not be facilitating those trolls by selling off publicly funded research to them. Um, and then of course, freedom of expression cuts across all these things. If you're feeling surveilled, if your voice is being limited with equity issues um, and you're not free to express yourself, um, you know, we think it's incredibly important for students to be able to advocate for themselves. And this gets us all to the <clears throat> university app mandate campaign, which is soft launching today. And we're doing a more formal launch in two weeks. Uh, which is basically, um, it sounds like UCF has one of these contact tracing apps that I'd love to hear more about from y'all. Um, but basically, there are universities trying to return to in-person education are using, requiring apps on phones or just on browsers and sometimes actual physical devices. There's one device called the bio button, which you have to uh, put on and it tracks your temperature and your heartbeat all day and that all goes to the company which monitors the students on behalf of the school. Um, so these mandates, if they're for students or faculty or staff or just community members um, are not okay. Uh, <clears throat> at the very least, they create, um, they kind of take away trust that users have in the public health entities. But more importantly, they're often done in flawed and not transparent ways where, you know, it's reasonable for students to think, uh, all right, this app is taking my location data. I don't know how, what they mean by that. And I don't know if the company gets to hold on to this forever. I don't know if the university has access to this. I better just not take my phone with me. And then that ultimately undermines the contact tracing effort uh, because there is no trust in this. Um, the link to the petition is not coming out until a little bit later today. I was hoping to do it right before this, uh, but I will send it to the Hack UCF email as soon as it's out. Um, yeah, and essentially this campaign is saying, hey, universities, um, don't make this required. Let us um, opt into it. And part of that consent is tell us exactly what, how these apps work, how the data is gonna be handled, and these sort of details that we need to feel secure and trust them enough to actually choose to use them um, rather than just forcing it on everyone 
and making us all guinea pigs. Um, so with that, um, I'm happy to field more questions, um, especially if you have more questions about the app mandate campaign um, or about any other issues specific to UCF. <clears throat> I'm also gonna drink some water. So. Um, well, if that's it for questions, then I'll just, um, <laughs> oh yes, my, uh, my gray goose in the Guinness. Um, so yeah, if there's no other questions, uh, here's my email. Um, here's the organizing email. Definitely reach out to either of those. Um, and yeah, we'll do everything we can to help you. You are an Alliance member um, and we want you to succeed and feel supported by the Alliance. Um, additionally, if you want to know more um, about EFA and other EFA groups, uh, you can go to EFF.org slash fight. And if anyone is feeling generous and wants to support the EFF, or you know someone who might want to support the EFF, uh, they can go to EFF.org slash join and become a member. Oh, I almost forgot. I sent to y'all, I don't know if you got it yet. Mail is crazy these days. Um, I sent y'all a bunch of stickers uh, for the EFF um, and maybe a pin, at least a bunch of stickers. So I hope you get that swag um, and put them on your laptops and whatnot. Um, oh, we got the webcam covering sticker that doesn't leave any residue. Um, yeah, so enjoy those stickers. Um, but if you want more swag, uh, EFF.org slash join is the way to go. Um, yeah, and that's all I got. Thank you again so much for offering me this time and please keep in touch. I want to support y'all. Thank you, Rory. Thank you everyone for coming to our meeting today. Um, if you are so inclined to continue the social event uh, and social communications and whatnot, um, please feel free to stop in our Discord. Um, also, we do have that workshop tomorrow at noon on home labbing, as a quick reminder. Um, a final thank you to Rory and to everyone for showing up today. And with that, we'll go ahead and call it here. So thank you everyone and uh, have a fun weekend and a spooky Halloween. Have a good one. <laughs>